Hi all, welcome to the Ask Me Anything um, session where we're gonna have a chance to dive into some questions that have been submitted by new members. And this is our chance to support you powerfully and also, you know, hear questions that you might not have thought of or you may not have encountered yet, but will someday. And this is a great opportunity for us to also come together as a community and, you know, make comments and support each other, uplift each other. I know that oftentimes we can feel on our own with some of these parenting challenges, and it really doesn't need to feel like that. And you at least have me, <laughs> uh, parenting coach Vanessa Callahan here. I am the, the founder and lead coach of Raising Our Resilience, and I run a year-long program for powerful parents seeking solutions who want to create a, life, a lifelong legacy of love, respect, and mutual appreciation um, for, the, for, the, for now and for all the years ahead with their children. So let's raise resilient kids together, and uh, we'll dive in. So the first question that was submitted to me, um, you know, through the the new member, uh, you know, forum was from Caitlin Halferty. And she says, how do I set boundaries in a thoughtful way with my two-year-old? Now, if you have kids that are older than two, there's still something here for you. Okay, so listen carefully as I share with you some of my hot tips about setting boundaries that really do last the ages. It's not just for two-year-olds, okay? So listen to this. And if you're if you're not on um, live on Zoom or on Facebook, um, just know and you're listening to the YouTube or you're listening to the replay, know that you can always drop a comment in the chat with your own question, okay? And I'd be happy to either answer it right there in the comments or the chat, or I can um, have you on another Ask Me Anything and we'll address your question then, all right? Okay, so starting with Caitlin's question. So setting boundaries is all about clarity and consistency. And so I always ask my clients and folks who, you know, are, attend my workshops on setting boundaries to really make sure that whatever it is you're asking for, it is unwaveringly clear. And sometimes what uh, a way that it's unclear is that it's too vague. So if we say, you know, um, be safe or clean up or um, be nice. These are vague, right? It's not really like they're, they're kind of up for interpretation. So if we can get one way that we can get clear is to be more specific. And especially depending on the age of the child, um, we want to be more concrete. So you could say even use your words is a little vague, but you could say, would you like to tell, would you like to tell your friend what you need right now? You know, it could be aiming at around six to nine years old, maybe even four or five. But at a, with a two-year-old Caitlin, you might actually supply the words and say, are you trying to ask, you're saying, want to play? You're asking, can, do you want to play? And then instead of saying, use your words, right? So for example, child comes up to another child, starts grabbing the toy out of their hand, right? And then you could say, oh, sweetie. <laughs> instead of saying, use your words, you could say, um, would you like to, to ask, can I play? I play too. I play too, right? Something like that, depending on their language level. So we're looking for specificity and we're looking for clarity. And the clarity sometimes is more between you and yourself or you and another caregiver. For example, you might not sit your two-year-old down and talk out all the ways that you're going to be reinforcing the boundaries around using your words instead of using your hands. But you will implement it consistently and clearly with the knowledge that we are going to enter, like, you know, you and a caregiver, maybe a teacher or a co-parent or another person that's in your child's life, we're going to intervene if the child is trying to make something happen with their hands where words would work better. That's our general rule. And how? And here are five examples of when we would do that. When they're grabbing a toy out of another kid's hand, when they're um, pushing, pushing somebody instead of asking them to get out of the way, when they're hitting us instead of um, saying our name to get our attention, um, when they're you know throwing something and when, when really what they want is something different or they, they want to let us know they don't like it, right? Um, they're smashing something that they dislike instead of just stating their preference, right? So even that is just like a little recipe for one, two, three, four, five ways that you can set a boundary and be more clear with another caregiver and talking that through. And, and I think picking one to three strategies. So there's redirection, there's replacement behavior, and then there's also like meeting some underlying need. And if you rotate through those three, usually you come, come across one of the three that's working. And it's, it's sure a whole lot better than giving vague feedback and then punishing. So 
let's just let's see if we can move towards specificity, concrete, concrete requests, clarity at with that that is consistent and suggesting useful things. Again, you know, alternative an alternative behavior, you know, swapping out, um, redirecting, and perhaps, you know, meeting an underlying need. Like maybe they need attention right now, or they're hungry, or they're lonely, <laughs> you know, those kinds of things. Okay. So it's a place to start, Caitlin. I'd love to hear your feedback. Like what, what stood out to you? Where are you still stuck? Let's get you more specific support. Okay. And this is a great time of the year to take my parenting quiz, by the way, because if I see in there um, that there are many areas that you would like to skill up and learn more about, it gives me the opportunity to reach out to you and say, hey, it was this, could this be your year to really dive into parenting work and you know join our year-long immersion? And we can explore that together. But you know, taking the quiz is the best way to do that because then we have the opportunity to actually look at a, look over your results and get specific about what what's working and what's not working, and even um, get you some specific um, ideas of what to focus on next. So please go ahead and take that quiz if you haven't yet, the parenting skills quiz. I just met with a family this morning who had taken it, um, you know, actually to support their teenagers, um, their teenage daughter, and it was lovely because we were then able to hop on a, a free session and I was able to support them powerfully because they had the opportunity um, to like think these things through and get some get some clarity on what they're strong in and what they still need support in. And that just made a much better conversation. So parenting strengths quiz, it's available for you. I've had over 400 people take it, um, probably more like 600 at this point. Uh, and it's, yeah, very, very helpful. So please check that out. All right, on to the next question, friends. Here we go. So this one's from Karen. Um, Nashun, Nashan. Um, so Karen, she says her biggest challenge is trying to help her five-year-old with patience, focus, and attention. She'd like a suggestion of what to do to help her kids with these areas, patience, focus, and attention. And so this is um, pretty broad, but it's, it's so relatable. I'm sure that people listening to this could relate to wanting your kid to be more patient, to focus, and to put their attention on the things you would hope they would. Um, so a five-year-old is in an interesting time. I mean, all kids are at interesting ages and stages, but five-year-olds are transitioning between like the three to six to the six to nine, um, sort of age band developmental planes. And so their, their interests are going to evolve pretty rapidly over a short period of time anyway. So this is a bit of a moving target. So with that in mind, what I would be doing is First, instead of trying to get them to be more patient and focus and give attention, I'd like you to really double down on modeling it for them. And the way I want you to do that is um, kind of clever. I would like you to get into their world about the things that they already have patience for, they already have their focus on, they already have attention on. Because within those areas uh, lies a lot of potential. There are the, the attention is already arriving on its own. The focus is already arriving naturally on its own. And what I want you to do is make some observations. What kinds of activities, what kinds of topics, what kinds of modes of sort of relating sensorially? Like, do they need to be touching a thing, listening to a thing, you know, have music and rhythm involved, um, have, you know, visuals involved for them to get, to, for it to draw their attention in? Are they especially drawn to humor or suspense or adventure? Um, you know, what, what sort of lights them up and gets their focus going already? And then I want you to sort of emulate those, at least one element from that when you're trying to get their attention. So let's say it's humor. They love funny shows. They could watch their funny cartoon show like for hours, or they could, um, you know, hang out and tell the crack jokes for hours. So I would just, you know, you might want to try to make it more serious and get them to focus on what you want them to focus on. But is there a silly transition? Can you play be playful in the way that you bring their focus over to something else? Not in like a convincing way, like, hey, let's go over here. It's going to be funny over there too. It's like being told is not the same as being shown. So maybe show them that you're ready to do this in a silly way. Make a face, throw on an accent, tell a joke. Um, offer to do it in a silly way, like, oh, well, we got to go to the bathroom, but do we want to hop or do we want to crawl, you know, and you just start hopping. And it just is like you're working with what's already working, you see, building on success. Now, I see a few people here on Facebook say, hey, in the chat, and let us know if you have any comments or questions, things that stand out to you, things you like. 
it helps the other folks who ask the questions to, to sort of like, you can help them kind of take notes if you pull a takeaway out that you like. Good, okay. Um, so I would start there. And then if you wanna also build patience, make sure you're modeling patience. Patience is one of those things that we can run short of as parents and caregivers. In, or if we're doing it, we're not necessarily, um, it's almost like it's invisible work that's happening. So you can name it that you're being patient with them. It's like, I'm now I'm going to, I'm going to take a few minutes to listen to your whole story and be really patient. Okay, go. And you're like, you give them their full attention and you're really patient, even though the story does not have a point, <laughs> just really patient, ask questions, nod, right? Show them what patience looks like. Another thing you can do is be patient about getting their attention. This is a top level skill, friends. So really write this one down. Oftentimes we ask our kids to um, be patient about getting our attention, but we don't we don't extend the same courtesy to them. Or if we do, we do it in a way that's a little maybe passive aggressive or indirect. So I would like this all families to have a very direct practice of going into the same room as the person you want you want to focus on you, right? That you want to get their attention. Finding some way to just pause and take even three seconds to notice what they're doing and name it. So here's how it could sound or how it could look and sound. You walk into the room and you notice a child working on um, a, a blocks sculpture, okay? And you go up and you, and you, instead of saying, hey, sweetie, it's time for us to go, you know, go, go to bed or it's time for us to brush teeth, let's say. You could say, oh, I see you're building with your blocks. So simple, right? Oh, I see this. And then you can even get down at their level and ask one thing about it. Oh, what, what's this one about? Like, why did you put this here? Or um, tell me about this. Let them, like, let them let you into their world a moment, right? And then be patient with what comes next. Sweetie, it's gonna be time to transition to brushing teeth soon. Would you like one minute or two minutes to wrap up your, 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 your step here? Usually they choose two minutes over one minute, or sometimes they're just like, oh, I can go now. Um, so just that little recipe of a of a be in the same room, notice what they're doing, say, say that you see it, right? Um, ask a little question to kind of connect up and then give a little heads up on the transition. It might take a total of four to, you know, three to five minutes, we'll say. But what you're doing is you're establishing that no family member is expected to just drop everything and come to you or drop everything and do what you say, including them to you. So you get to ask them in reverse for the exact same thing. Oh, sweetie, I need one to two minutes. <laughs> do you see that I'm working on like that, that I'm cooking things on the stove right now? Do you see that I'm on a phone call, right? Oh, right. Yeah, I'm on the phone. So like they may not be aware enough on their own at first to notice th that other people are involved in what they're involved in, or they might need more time, but you can lead them down that path. And eventually I've had kids come up to me and go and look, you know, cause they're about to interrupt me, look and, and, and stop and like notice that I'm working with another child, for example, or I'm in the middle of writing something on my computer or right. And then, and then last tip pro tip here, and this is for especially kids under, under nine, 10, is to have some kind of um, way that they can even silently come up to you and let you know that they want your attention. It could be like a hand squeeze or a hand on your hip, hand on your shoulder. Um, you decide what it is as a family. Maybe they can put something in your hand. <laughs> um, that means I'd like your attention soon, but I also see that you're busy. Oh my gosh. And then imagine if you do that for them too. It just is a game changer. So I've seen this work across 12, 24, 36, and 48 kids. Imagine you literally cannot be available at all times because you're just not, right? You're like a, a limited quantity of attention and kids have to learn patience. And I would get kids back from the break going, they would actually not even just call my name, Vanessa, Vanessa, across the room. They'd call me mom, mom. And I was like, oh, you're doing the thing that you do at home, you know, which sometimes is okay, right? Um, but in times where I'm not available, um, you know, like teaching times in the classroom where there's more than one person around. I just, I go like this. And this is for, for like three to nine year olds, right? So I'm like, walk over here. And just that, oh, the, they click back into it. They go, oh, right, because we've been over it. And they, they know that this is the actual expectation and there's some patience involved. 
And I'm definitely not going to shout across the room to them while I'm in the middle of something because that would be interrupting. And there are polite and respectful ways to interrupt that we could teach our kids, which is an exciting prospect. A lot of times, like I didn't know until I was a teacher um, that you could even do this, right? That you could train kids to interrupt politely. I, I mean, I always thought they either needed to be sort of catered to or they need to be squashed. That's kind of the two models I grew up with, like permissive parenting and um, authoritarian parenting, right? Here's this middle ground where we respect each other and we collaborate about how to do so. I love that. It's like a calm, empowered feeling <laughs> when you have that in place. Here's another one. How do I teach my six-year-old empathy? I love this question. So, so good. Um, and I just want to say hey to Ryan, who's here again on Zoom. I'm so glad you made it to another one. Here's the next question. Um, so this is from Alexandra. So empathy is one of those things that um, does have a developmental stage where it fully starts to emerge. And this is, I'm going to put in a caveat here, a disclaimer that it's talking about a bell curve. So when we talk about a bell curve, you know, that means the majority of kids land on the, the peak of the bell curve, but it can be, there's quite a bit of a variation. So for most children, according to our bell curve of development, it's not until seven and a half that true empathy really arrives. We have to understand what that means. So true empathy is being able to put your own perspective aside and take on the perspective of another person and act and, and be able to like live, imagine into it long enough to gain some insight about how that perspective may be similar or different from your own. And then and then go back to your own perspective and be able to make some comparison and draw forward what you that exercise you just did. This like mental gymnastics of being able to step into someone else's shoes. So with your six-year-old Rexanda, I would say that you're at the cusp of you know this being something that is neurologically, physiologically more possible and within reach for your child. I used to teach six to nine-year-olds. I was in a, a six to nine-year-old um, classroom teacher. I had a Montessori classroom with three, eight, three age groups in my room. So I knew curriculum, you know, for, for a five-year span because I had kids I was remediating for and advanced um, kids. And that included social emotional growth. So I definitely saw kids outside off the bell curve, you know, kind of delayed or, or kind of precocious or early developers in empathy. But what I noticed is that, you know, on average, it's the second graders or the, when they turn around seven and a half, you know, even early eighth graders, depending on when their birthday is, they're the ones who would start to have these different kinds of, like a different level of insight to contribute, for example, to conflict resolution. They would soften their position and imagine what the other kid was feeling. Uh, imagine what the other kid might've been thinking. Imagine what the other kid might need or want from the situation. And they were much, more adept at conflict resolution in the sense that they really did get it, like what what was what the other side was needing or wanting. Um, and I saw a market change definitely around this age. Um, it can happen a little earlier in girls on average, and it can be a little delayed in boys. But by the time they were nine and leaving my room, one of the things I was looking for was that they really were able to take on the perspective of someone else. And if they couldn't, I would flag that right developmentally for the parents and caregivers saying. Something's not arriving yet. We had to work on this even more and we would flag it even as early as eight if it wasn't happening. So if you have a child who's eight or older and they really are struggling with empathy, that's something you're gonna to wanna to take a closer look at and maybe even have a chat with me about. So I'd like to hear more about what you mean by that and, and help you assess whether, you know, this is something to be concerned about or something that you can kind of let ride for a little longer. So how do we actually teach it? Well, perspective taking is the first muscle, right? So it's like, it's the primary muscle of empathy. And what you can do with kids younger than seven and a half is you can scaffold towards, you know, towards it so that it's not like this new skill that's coming out of nowhere. Uh, we call it planting seeds of empathy. And a lot of times it comes through best through literature and characters. And that kids have an easier time imagining how a character is feeling because they've they've taken the time to like conjure them up, create them in their mind, and they're just a little more dexterity there around being able to sort of see from their perspective, typically, especially because a lot of the stories that that they're being told are simpler and more straightforward than real life in a lot of ways, right? This kid fell down, how might and they're crying, how might might they feel? Um, this kid's friend won't talk to them anymore and they're feeling, how might they feel excluded, right? And you can talk about what does exclusion mean or left out. 
So seeds of empathy are just as important as waiting for the right developmental time. So keep keep on that. You know, whenever you're, you have the opportunity to imagine the inside story of a character, do it. I used to teach that in writing workshop in my classroom. I would have the kids, and this is something I recommend to clients too, um, you know, depending on the situation, but it's sort of like, okay, you've told me the outside story. Now let's investigate the inside story. So, and then we talk about how do other people feel? How do you feel? Like what was going on inside your thoughts, your feelings, you know, um, your wishes, you know, what's bothering you um, from what the inside part of it, the story is because kids up until age six, they're often just talking about what's going on on the outside. And they're not really necessarily re revealing their inside story and, or, even considering that there's an inside story to all the other all the other people who are in the story. <laughs> so we like to do things like, okay, what happened? And then what happened next? And what happened next? Write out a little story and then go, okay, in this first part, what was the inside story? So in other words, you know, um, my grandma came to visit from New York and we played um, card games. Great. How did it feel to have grandma come? Oh, I was excited. Okay, let's add that. That's going to make the story so much more interesting. Right? How did it feel when you started playing cards? Oh, I I had a lot of fun and it made me feel like like this glowing feeling in my chest. That's so interesting. Put it in the story, right? Um, and then the second part of the story is, you know, uh, we ate dinner and they 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 served some kind of food that you really don't like, um, and they and they're like, oh my gosh, like let's say it's gefilte fish or something. You're like, oh, and then the fish came out. And it was so stinky. And it's like, okay, let's talk about how that felt. Well, at first it, I felt disgusted, but then after, I, after, but then I got curious when other people were saying it was good. Great, put that in there. Then I tasted it and then I was, I felt silly because I remembered that I actually do like it. It just had been a long time since I'd eaten it. Wow, this is a much better story now. So there's ways I've done this with six-year-olds, you know, five, six, seven-year-olds as they're leading into that more, that empathy um, kind of showing up and arriving in a really significant way. And then by the time they're eight and nine, I just get tell them, hey, can you add in the inside story? And sometimes they add an entire page. It's beautiful. They like pour themselves out on the page. So there's a lot to work with here. And I just want you to kind of pull forward what's possible when you like, just like ask the question, like what's the inside story? What could be going on for so-and-so in this book we're reading or in the story that we're writing or this movie we're watching or when we think about what happened today? Yeah, what could the inside story be? People don't usually just hit each other. <laughs> people don't usually just um, take each other's stuff. You know, people don't, you know, like that's that seems so random, but like maybe there's something going on inside that person that made them want to do that. So you can talk it through with your kids. Yeah. Okay. So that's another way you can, there's so much there. This is a really fun topic and yeah, so, so fun to jam on. So let me know if there's more you'd like around that. Let's see. Okay. I've got Jessica. Oh, that's funny. Okay. So usually I don't answer client questions in these, but this one snuck in. So I'm going to do it anyway, since it was published that I was going to do it. And you were probably contacted Jessica. So I'm going to tag you here. Um, so, okay, here we go. Is this, is it, if it's who I think it is, I'm just going to double check. Yeah. Okay. So Jessica and I, and her, her husband and I, we've been working together for, for a good part of the year. And so we must've pulled this out of the, out of an earlier um, request to join. So Jessica says the hardest thing I face is making sure everyone is getting along and keeping peace in the household. Can you offer any strategies? Oh yes. Okay. Well, it's lovely. Cause I know, I know what's happening in your family pretty well, but I'll also maintain confidentiality here on the specifics, Jessica, no worries. This is general advice. So Jessica, um, with three children in the household with very different personalities, it's always going to be a, um, a balancing act around like how to carve out enough one-on-one -on -one time and enough like one-on-two time and enough one-on-three time and two-on-three time. It gets really dynamic really quickly. And one one pitfall that I see a lot of families fall into as they get bigger is they start to st start to kind of push for everybody doing everything at the same time all 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 day all like afternoon long or all morning long or all weekend long, and it just doesn't work. And I'm and if it is working for you and your family and your multiple sibs, I'm going to tell you right now that at least one of them is going along with it to keep the peace, but isn't actually getting everything they need. <laughs> and here's why I say that. It's because when we have kids with a, you know, with enough of an age gap, like you do eight and 13 is pretty significant. 
Um, and you have, you know, I know you happen to have strong personalities in your household. And if you have strong personalities, they need different things from each parent. And they also um, can have sibling conflicts that often become the main flavor of family time. And so if they're not getting enough breaks from each other, quality time with you, an opportunity to sort of have some privacy, like maybe some alone time even, depending on their age, especially your 13-year-old, your teens, it is it is set up for problems. I'm just going to say that. So immediate, like the immediate thing I would, I, I tend to do with families, with big families, and they are really wanting family time to work is I say, have less of it and have better, better time of it. And really get to know each of your kids and what they sort of their preferred activities are and build in some special time with each of them at least once a week, whatever that looks like. Now, some of you've heard of special time. It's something, it's a term I'm borrowing from hand in hand parenting. Um, the idea is it's quality time one on one where, you know, they they get your undivided attention and they're not they're, they have some space and time from their siblings um, if they have them. Uh, but also space and time from like the things that you normally would be doing, like um, perhaps now if if setting time aside sounds like a pie in the sky idea. Like I work with busy parents only. I don't really have any parents who are just sitting around in my program and in my life. Um, I don't like introduce me to a few. That'd be kind of fun. It'd be like a lot more chill, <laughs> but typically, you know, one of the things we're up against is we don't have a lot of time. So how can we get the same result with less time? I'm borrowing from my coach Imani's sort of wisdom. She's always like, okay, one of her, one of her tips is same result, less time. Because oftentimes we think we we create our own barriers by assigning a rule that the only way you have quality time is if it's a whole hour, or the only way you can have quality time is if you. These are just examples, you know, um, is if you are doing um, something that's outside of the normal routine. Like it couldn't be making dinner together because like that happens all the time. And these rules, same same result, less time can can um, trouble and open up possibilities because without realizing it, sometimes we box things in and then they become out of reach. Like self-care can be that way where you're like, oh, I can't make it all the way to the gym and do a yoga class and all the way back. I just don't have time for that. So I'm not going to do yoga. And I was like, you can have a mat next to your bed and you roll it out and do five minutes when you wake up and that would count. Maybe not exact same result, but same result in the sense of like affirming your identity as someone who does yoga and takes care of themselves. Absolutely. Yes. Right. So how can we do that with special time? Well, one of my tips is don't make a rule about how long it needs to be at the get-go. Like aim low, small, start small, right? And then see if you can expand it and find more, more extended periods of the time. The second thing is don't make a rule around it having to be separate from your regular routines, like build it in. Like perhaps you just do a little bit of a longer cooking process because cooking with children usually takes longer than if you do it by yourself or like a longer grocery shopping process or a longer, you know, you're getting the idea. And you involve your kids meaningfully where they have a really collaborative role. Um, and depending on the age of the child, you know, involve them. So maybe they're only scrubbing potatoes and you're doing all the chopping, but they're doing something right to get ready. Maybe they're measuring things, but they're not they're not stirring the hot pot or in charge of anything that has to do with fire. Or maybe they're older and they're doing you're you're their sous chef. You're assisting them like my son at 10, my stepson loved cooking. He was into it and he loved bossing. So he, for so for him, like a dream hangout, you know, besides playing video games together, which we did as well to get into his world, I played a lot of video games for a lot of hours, <laughs> um, was cooking together, you know, and he, he picked the recipe, he was in charge and I was supporting him and it was great. We hummed right along. We had our little, our little, little ritual around it, you know, it was great. Um, so I wonder what you could create with your family to do that as well. Um, and that can balance things out and kind of cut down sibling conflicts and things like that by quite a bit, 20 to 30% as a place to start. Next thing, which Mike and Jessica have done is bring in a lot of tools because you're going to need to run things smoothly around routines, having consistent limits, keeping your cool so you don't lose it um, when they're losing it. Um, and especially problem solving skills and conflict resolution skills, because Spicy siblings will always be spicy and they really need these tools for life so that they don't have these stacked up hurts that just like it takes nothing to set them off again, right? Um, and the last but not least I would do is strengths inventory and or interest inventory to figure out like what, where do they overlap? Where do they differ? See how to uplift those differences and help them find activities that they prefer to do together. 
um, and then limit that to, especially with teens, no more than once a week demand on any kind of leave the house half day or like, you know, multiple hour family outings. If you start telling teens that they need to be with you for over an hour a day for more than three to three days a week, you're, it's a losing strategy. I'm just telling you right now. <laughs> okay. Cause they need to start focusing on their peers unless they're initiating. That's different. All right. Good one. We're, we're scaling up the ages here, as you can tell. Ryan, I'm curious if anything's standard, standing out to you since you've been here the whole time. Drop, drop a comment in the chat. It really is safe. It's not just for me to put these questions in. <laughs> All right. Because um, I love it. You know, we have more really meaningful moments in these um, Ask Many Things when people put put anything in the chat, either their own question or, you know, asking, you know, saying something that stood out to you. Like maybe there's a particular tip that stands out to you because you have multiple kids too, for example, et cetera. And I'm not talking just to Ryan. This is anybody who's listening. Please go ahead and put it, put your thoughts in the chat. Okay. So this next one is sometimes I really struggle with keeping my cool. Can you offer any practical advice for staying cool when things get chaotic? Patty's is one of my favorite questions. I think somebody asked it last last time too, last month. Um, I've definitely taught a lot um, of of adults about um what it's like to get to the other side of being reactive. And this is just like a life, this is a general life skill, by the way. And if we don't take the time to cultivate it, for most of us, it's, it, it does not necessarily come naturally because we're hardwired to react. We're hardwired to, you know, that fight, flight, freeze, appease kind of reaction. It's hardwired. And so naturally we're gonna you know, lose our cool, especially if someone in the room is losing their cool. We have these handy things called mirror neurons that tend to mirror what we, what we see. And then, so we like an empathy, and sympathy so then we end up feeling what they're feeling and then having our own reaction to all of the things that are happening so being aware of how it works is one of the hacks it's one of the things i teach in my you know my regular workshops that i teach to schools about navigating big emotions meltdowns tantrums power struggles um if this is something that you would like support with i would just say patty like consider bringing me in also for a workshop into your community because I can empower the whole community and get you some advice around it. The idea is you got to be a pretty good lid detector of how far off your lid is and how far off the kids lids are so that you can ca hopefully catch it early enough to put, put the lid back on and kind of get your brain working in the right direction so you have access to things like long-term memory and decision-making skills and you can get your parasympathetic nervous system going to calm yourself down so being aware of and, and like, like tuning into what your tells are that you're starting to get dysregulated and that lid you know that metaphorical lid is starting to come off is a really good great skill to have something you can practice and, and absolutely learn and then have for the rest of your life. I'm um, definitely trained folks on that. Um, another thing is to be able to tell, like to know what your children's tells are. You know, they start to whine a little bit. They start to, um, you know, drag themselves around a little bit. Maybe they're um, hot in the face. Their cheeks are a little pink and red. You know, start to notice what are your children's tells around this. And just being able to detect that is step one. Because if you, without awareness, you don't really have much that you can do. You're not very empowered, right? You need the awareness to be able to then choose. So I would be focusing a lot on that. Next is to find your go-to strategy. And this is something where, you know, I've already built a guide around. So if this is something you would like to have, like some guide, specific guidance on this, um, I'll drop a link in the chat in just a moment here where you can um, sign up and get get not only the guide, but some guidance about how to use it. Um, so it's, it's called the six quick and easy strategies to keep your cool um, and stay calm. So, and it's specifically designed for parents to not only do themselves, but to do with their children. So their kids, because there's, there's, there are ones that kids love in this as well. It's not just for the parents, but um, so I want you to explore that guide, Patty, and, and also see like, which ones end up feeling like the right fit to you? Because I, I could tell you to breathe, but that's not the same as <laughs> having you look at the six strategies and decide. And like I have this course that I bonus in with my year long immersion that walks you through all six of these. Um, and so if this is something you're interested in and you also think there's some wisdom to, you know, maybe just calming the chaos in the first place, like 
having smooth routines and clear limits and conflict resolution skills and you know those kinds of things in place and like ways to motivate your kids without rewards and punishments like maybe the year-long immersion is for you it could be something really beneficial to you and your kids to like be proactive too so there's less to be upset about does that make sense no okay uh right and thanks for putting in a comment. Ryan says, specialized time is helpful to know. And spending time, such as playing video games, isn't just a waste. It's a way to bond and have casual conversations. Totally, yes. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't really able to address a hot topic with my stepson until we played video games with each other for about six months. And we would have casual conversations about it. The hot topic was who's going to clean the bathroom that he and his sister use and guests use because we're starting to get to a point where it was like, Nobody wanted to do it and people were coming over. And so then I would do it and it just wasn't okay. <laughs> we needed to figure it out. But I pl first played video games with him for quite some time, you know, before so that we could just have some time where we were connecting up and know it's not a waste if you're interactive with each other and you keep it light and fun and you practice asking for his ideas and opinions and having more collaboration around the game too is really lovely because then you can carry that over into how you're going to collaborate about things like how the bathroom gets clean, which is what my stepson and I got around to eventually. And it, it was good. We, we actually figured out a lot of things together, a story, a longer story for another time. Nice, Ryan. Love it. Um, so last one from Kayla, she says, the hardest thing I'm facing right now as a parent is adjusting to having a preteen help. She says with an exclamation point. So, um, Kayla, it looks like you have a 12 and a half year old from what you what you shared. Yeah, that's right. Oh, Kayla, I feel for you. I know it's not easy. It's like, so I did this, went through this with my stepson and then I also had students who ended up coming back to me um, after I, they left my classroom for a few years and wanted me to homeschool, tutor them. And like they were in a, such a different developmental plane and it's, it's just really interesting to adjust to like that transition between childhood and adulthood. Like there's, um, there's definitely like a, a part where something within ourselves that we have to resolve that's still attached to things being simpler or easier or cuter or more innocent or less lower stakes or whatever it is about the younger years we have to sort of like embrace that we're now in a new part of like parenting life. It really is different. And there's a lot of advantages, right? Like uh, generally you can trust them to be alone. They can kind of self-manage their self-care routine overall, like just the basics at least. It's not, not really usually a skill issue if they're not doing their hygiene stuff. Um, like they, they usually have a lot of skills. And then the ones they don't, it's just glaringly obvious and you, you know address those and kind of gap fill from the past, but then some things that can make us all feel more confident going into the teen years are the things I've been mentioning. So not every teen has had the opportunity to contribute to their like routine building, right? And actually coming up with the sequence that of their self-care. They know how to do it, but they, they know how to do each item, but they maybe haven't really done the executive ordering of it, right? So sometimes even like going over routines with 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 uh, young teenagers can be wildly helpful and you can call them like life hacks now. Um, so it's not so much about like a young kid routine, you know, like like the getting dressed routine is like way too young for 12 and a half. But the life hack of like, how are you going to manage your morning is really interesting to them often. Um, and then you got to level up your approach. And oftentimes you start from the top down instead of the bottom up. So what I mean by that is with younger kids, you're, you're doing skills. You're saying like, what are the steps? How are we going to put these steps in order? With, with teens and tweens, you start from the top down. What kind of morning do you want to have? What do you want it to feel like? What do you want it to look like? You know, you kind of do some visioning and some inquiry around what they want to create. Because now they're in this age where they're, they, they have opinions about that. And they have great vocabulary around it, potentially. Like, I want it to feel serene and smooth. Um, I want it to be relaxed. I want it to be low stress. I don't want drama. You know, these are some things that a 12 year old might say. And that's how astute of them. Like they're starting to have an idea of how life works now, but how to, so that's their vision. But then we, then you ask them based on what you've tried before, how do you think you can create that? 
for yourself. And so you just basically like, you're like a guide on the side, much more than like a sage on the stage, right? Like you're, you're definitely like guiding them through a thought process that they might not do on their own, but you're not thinking for them. And that's really important unless they, they ask you what you think or they get stuck. So let teens fill in as many of the blanks as possible. And then you like help them with what's left. Um, a really different approach. It's more top to, you know, like from, from the top to the bottom instead of the bottom to the top. Um, so think about that and how you can apply it going forward. And one thing that teens are really sensitive to, and I'm just going to put this out there as a general rule, they cannot stand advice that was unsolicited and they did not consent to hear from you. Okay. Especially if they think you don't get it. Now, I know it's a very general thing to say, you don't get it. Well, guess what our new job is, parents, when we have tweens and teens, to get it as much as possible. And that means we can't just use generalities. We can't say, well, when I was a kid, I mean, we can. You can do whatever you want. But what I'm, I'm telling you will be more effective is if you ask really good questions and get into their, get, get into their world enough so that you have enough information to even have a basis of giving advice. Now. That's not to discount your life experience and what wisdom you've collected in your you know, decades of life. However, they're not gonna have that in mind when you give them advice and telling them that you know better because of your experience is kind of insulting to, to, to tweens and teens. That's like, like, it's basically gonna be very counter purpose to wanting them to receive your wisdom and your perspective. So start with them, start with what they know, start with what um, is going on get context before you give advice, name it that you're like, oh, cause I was going to say you should do this. But now that you've told me that, I don't think that's even helpful. That's not even a helpful suggestion anymore. That's how you win their respect and their trust. You'd be willing to say something. I was going to advise you. I'm not advising you anymore because you, now I understand better your situation. And if you can do it before you even give the advice, oh my gosh, big brownie points for you, like big, big credibility points for you, much more of a trusted advisor that you're building towards. Okay. All right. So hopefully some of these pieces have stood out to you. Um, and, and I want you to know, like, you know, whether you're in it, in it, <laughs> where your child is about to sh shift over to being in the teen years, just like um, for our, our one, our one friend here for Kayla. Um, or if this is kind of far off in the future, you can lay the groundwork for excellent relating in teen years and you still will have hard moments. Like it's just part of it. It's part of it. Like they're going to have big mood swings. They're going to have devastating moments of like feeling betrayed by friends and heartbreak of their first crush and, you know, all kinds of things. Like we can't stop that from happening. As a matter of fact, we wouldn't want them to. And here's, here's my thought around that. Our goal is not to protect our children from life. Our goal is to prepare children for life and help them pace out their experiences so that their growth happens in a way that's not traumatic and is instead informative and builds their resilience. Because kids will go through tough things, but if, they, if, it's, if it's paced out and they're doing it in a container of love and support that you've built together and they know that you're really there for them, not just in word, but in action because of the way you've collaborated on routines and you've set clear expectations and collaborated on what the consequences will be, good and bad. You've worked through conflicts and resolutions effectively for years and years. You get to those teen years and for those of you who are in it, you can still backfill this stuff you really become that trusted advisor. You become someone they can bring hard things to. And, you know, as I've been talking to and counseling parents of, you know, toddlers to teens, it's the teen parents who are really focused on this piece. They're like, in the end of the day, I just want a strong relationship with my kid where they can come to me with hard things. And they know that I'm in their court and that I'm a safe person to do that with. Um, and I want to have the kind of relationship where we, we remain close in that way. And that's a beautiful thing. And it really is, one of the better outcomes we could we can hope for is that we have that relationship and they're as prepared for life as possible without traumatizing them and instead empowering them. So yeah, all of this is beautiful. Thank you for bringing these great questions forward. It gives me an opportunity to share, share some things that I've learned from my 20 plus years with kids. Most parents don't have <clears throat> decades of experience with children and yet you're expected to figure it all out. So this is my opportunity, you know, my 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 compassion for you, my dedication and my mission is to empower parents with tools that will help them feel more 
equipped, um, just like we do for our, we, we do everything for kids. We have so many programs for kids. We have so many programs for teachers, for childcare folks, for where are the parent programs? So here, this, that's what part of why I created my own program and I come here live and just share, share what I know from the other side of so many decades of working with families and kids. Hope it's been useful to you today. Um, and we're gonna take a break now for the winter um, break and then we'll be back in January. So, um, and we'll be rolling out some really fun announcements in the new year that I'm really excited about. So our team is taking a little rest and also working on something really exciting. So keep your eyes open for announcements. You'll be invited to a special event um, happening early spring. And uh, we can't wait to serve you more and more powerfully as we go forward into the new year. Have a wonderful break. And um, yeah, we'll see you all soon. Again, comments, chats, tags. I'm still in the Facebook group for the next week and a half. And then again, in January, if anything has come up, I'll come back and I'll answer any questions, thoughts, um, and happy to do so. Lots of love for each and every one of you. Take the quiz, grab the guide if you'd like. They're, both links are in the chat and the comments. And uh, we'll see you. we'll see you in a bit. All right, be well, enjoy your time together. And remember to breathe, <laughs> remember to affirm what's good. And remember, just try one next thing um, and feel free to come back into this group and, and onto the YouTube channel and look up a topic and you know grab some tools and strategies over the break while you have some downtime potentially, okay? While you're traveling, just a uh, quick listen and get some new ideas. All right, lots of love to each and every one of you until next time. Bye for now. Bye, Ryan. Bye, everybody on Facebook. Take, take care. See you next time.